Welcome back to What Have You. I'm Rachel Jankovic. I'm Becca Merkel. And today we're sitting in my future home driveway. With the engine off. And so you may see... Watching the wheat fields rustle in the wind. (laughs) It's kind of gorgeous beyond all right now. Yeah, you got to look past a little construction dirt pile and see the paradise beyond. (laughs) (laughs) It is. really good. It is. We're getting to that very end of the build process where everything is like... It's so close, but not yet. I need to go in and look because it just keeps on being. It's been like a week since I saw it, and I think there's much changed since I saw it. Probably, probably there is some change. It's been fun. Yes. Well, uh, I have to say we were out of town, and I've been having people say I needed to explain my actions on the podcast because. Of what of you some did. some Instagram posts <laughs> that I posted. <laughs> uh, so, last summer we took the kids back to England, which was fabulous because it had been 10 years or whatever since we'd been there. More than 10. 10? Yeah. We've been home for 10. Really? Yeah. And so, anyway, Whoa. they were little when we moved there and still little when we moved home and so it was so great to go back and revisit all the old stomping grounds and take them around and and it was such a party we had such a good time and then this year we were like we should see our own state a little bit because um you know there's there's a big amount of our state to see and since it's right here you don't always make the effort so we're like we're gonna just do it and it was short it was just like three days And we went down to southern Idaho, and and we decided to go out to see this ghost town um, called Silver City, which is way out in the Tule's. And and, um, there's two businesses in town still. One is this hotel, and one is called Pat's Whatnot Shop. So, So I think there's about five people in town at any given moment. Like actually, just in is the, the town. whatnots just whatnots, or does she carry groceries? No, you can get a Coke, you can get a candy bar, and you can get some jewelry, which we did actually. There was some jewelry some that what-nots. was kind of awesome. There was some whatnots. There's some jewelry that she got um, from Indians, like local Indians that made Ooh, jewelry. I would probably like that jewelry. Yeah, it's real. Why good. didn't you buy me some? It's real good. Um, and anyway, so so it was a true whatnot shop. And, um, that's all. That's what there is. There are a lot of old remains of this mining town, which had the first electricity in Idaho. It had the first telegraph in Idaho. It was a booming, thriving scene at one time. At its peak, there were 2,500 people there, which is hard to imagine because getting into it, even with a four wheel drive SUV, was a surprising Do you have event. to come on foot to get there pretty much before? <laughs> well, and then in this hotel, which is ramshackle beyond all and amazing, there's this old big bar in there that they got in from, like it was made in Cincinnati and they got that thing in. I can't even imagine how, like on a stagecoach <laughs> with this huge mirror, you know, and it was just really that is surprising. Kind of, that is kind of novel. Yeah, and, and like, it's just dirt, and there's this sign, like, 40 miles, there's, I think it's about 40 miles of dirt. Are you going to launch no, a I'm texting no, conversation? No, no, I'm not. I'm listening. There's, like, 40 miles of dirt road, which at the, at the entrance to it, it says, sort of, traveler beware, there's no more anything from here on out, like, there's no water, there's no nothing there's There's no no, huge there's basically there's no huge bars from Cincinnati it was like there's no help for you if anything goes wrong there's no help so anyway we make our way into this little place and this this hotel there are just no words for this thing (laughs) you have to go to Becca's Instagram and look at what it was some of the pictures I put up of rooms our rooms they rent out they were not the ones we had ours were actually there was not wallpaper hanging off the walls and there was a bathroom in the hall that you could use which was very exciting and that was it there was one outlet in the in the place and it was out in the hall so <laughs> we could charge our phones 
<laughs> it was, so funny. It was intense. It really was. But we had such a good time. It was like there's old mine shafts running under the hotel. I think that's the real question mark is whether or not it's going to fall through into the mines below. <laughs> Um, it was, and there were tunnels going from, we didn't go in, but running from the old Chinese laundry across the street. That was just the storefront. And then they trucked through the tunnel to the laundry, which was actually under the hotel. Anyway, it was all very weird. That is weird. Yeah. And it's just, there's a lot of people who come in like on four wheelers in the summer. And when I say a lot, I mean like maybe 12. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, really, the tourist bust of the of a, year is when 15 a hustle four and a bustle. And um, yeah, so we stayed overnight and they cooked us a breakfast out of coolers, I think, that they had wow. had running there. So, so did so, you have to make reservations here or do you just yeah, show up? No, they have we to made know you're coming. Yeah. And, and, um, That's a really weird uh, industry. How can yeah. anyone have found I a way to live know. on it? I don't know. Occasionally making but it, breakfast in an abandoned yeah, hotel but for people. The thing was, is there was an actual reward for cattle rustlers. Like, if, information leading to a cattle rustling problem. Like, it was an actual sign It was up. a current event. Yeah, and yeah. a wanted poster. Both tacked up in the entryway. And you think, like, is that... <laughs> I suppose if you wanted to be out of reach... You could go That's somewhere where like that. Be. So That's maybe where it's important go. to get the word to Silver mm-hmm. City first about <laughs> wanted people. <laughs> well, and then we took a scenic route out, which is hilarious because it's not like it wasn't scenic going in. It was stunning. And uh, you're up in the Owyhees, which I had always thought was like a mountain range, but it actually is more like a really high like uplands. Like you go mm. way up, you go up a mile. And then you're way up at 6,000 something feet, but it's okay. just this scrubby sagebrush, total Louis L'Amour happening yeah. up in there. <laughs> and sagebrush, and that was about it up wow. there with these canyons cutting through everything. It was great. We had such a good time. But anyway, uh, when they showed us around the hotel, this lady showed us around, and she was like, Yeah, this is room 26, it's the most haunted. <laughs> you know, like, oh, like okay. by cattle okay. rustlers or and, wanted <laughs> well, wanted no, men. I the next day I'm like, she's like, so no ghosts, and I was like, no, nope, we're fine. And she's like, well, I've never seen anything. You know, she yeah. was trying to kind of reassure us, like it's all right. And and I was like, well, what what is it supposed to be haunted by? And she goes, well, I've heard a lot of stuff. She was like, you know, some people come down and and they've run into screaming Alice. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why are they always named Alice too? But anyway. Alice is uh, always used as that kind of. A... But anyway, she um. She was like, yeah, some people run into screaming Alice. She goes, oh, in your room, somebody came uh talked to a small child in period clothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, is, it, it is interesting because you end up... <laughs> You end up with like, well, what kinds of people go to places like Silver City to spend the night? They're, they're, you know, they're, Becca, you right. and all the ghost hunters. <laughs> you are right. That's, and so that's how many times happens. do you think people in room 26 have been people who wanted to see a ghost? <laughs> Probably every time. Probably most people who spent yeah. the night in room 26 yeah. were hoping for something probably. creepy. That's so, probably you know, why they're there. I'm pretty sure it kind of fuels the imagination <laughs> to go spend the night well, in Silver City. It definitely could do that. I mean, it was, we went up and looked at the cemetery, which was this strangely beautiful, like just slope of a mountain. I don't even know how you would bury people there. It was like a rocky slope, you know, but it just so quiet and so stunning and so remote. And it's like, you're looking at the headstone of a guy who died in the Bannock Indian war, you know? Yeah. One time Luke and I stopped in a really little town, rural town near here. And there, well, it wasn't in the town, but it was clearly affiliated with the town. It was Uh like, there was an old farmhouse nearby. And then there was this little graveyard and we're like, it was like up on the hill kind of, it's near Uniontown. Yeah. And, and we were like, oh, we should walk up and see that graveyard. And, and then it was just like a total mystery of sadness. Like we got up there (laughs) to this, it was really a little graveyard, you know, like, um, like, I mean, I don't know, it's probably like 30 feet. You know, it was like a little, mm-hmm. little graveyard. But every grave 
that we saw was a baby the same it was all little children and babies the same year like there must have been some oh my gosh it was all really close together and it was like and this was the little graveyard that was just for all the children that died in one epidemic and it wasn't even like i can't remember if there were any adults in there i don't think it was just like a lot of children and you think i don't even know what this is, but I'm pretty sad about it but right it now. But it makes you so grateful for, you know, modern medicine. I Well, I'll tell you another In, thing. Here's yeah, another one. Or just one. the knowledge of how things... Yeah, it's really We sad. encountered a real mm-hmm. despicable event, you guys, on our way in. Oh, we're yeah. Driving, we're driving up this road. Rachel's gone back to her no, phone No, I'm again. not. I'm making sure that my... <laughs> We've gone... We're driving up this road, and it's dirt... Like, flat on the ground dirt. It's not like a, you know, it's not like even a gravel road. And, you know, we're driving along. It's kind of light dirt down there, too. It's kind of weird. It's different than our dirt. And there's these black things all over the road. And I was like, what is that? Is it like a, is it like a, um, my engine's off. That's why it's not charging. It had to be on to charge it? Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm like, what are those black things all over the road up there? Are they leaves? But they were like weirdly moving. And, yeah. All this and is it's gross. like, wait, wait, wait a second. And we <laughs> stop the car. And the road is covered. And I mean like covered in enormous like locusts. We were like, this is... We're having were a, they this kind? like a plague of locusts. No, I'll show you. I, they were called, we found out later, they were called Mormon crickets. Because, you know, the Mormons had that event with the crickets. And then the um, seagulls miraculously, like, ate them all or something. Uh. Do you remember that story? Mormon crickets. And these things are like jumbo shrimp. They're like, <laughs> they're like... <laughs> Hopping around, it's like if you pictured a black jumbo shrimp leaping about in the road in front of you. Uh, and this so, is not nice. I'm no, looking at pictures no, now. We took pictures, guys. I'm gonna have to post. Yeah, and oh, so that's not good. They're, but they're all over the road, and and there's no, there's nothing to do but drive over the top, like killing millions as we go. And it was seriously a swath, like maybe 40 miles of just solid crickets and then we find out some nasty facts about them um the lady in the hotel who ran the hotel who told us about screaming Alice she had um a dog frisbee that she left out like a frisbee made of hard plastic (laughs) and they ate it she showed Uh, us a picture good guys when the crickets come she showed us a picture of the shard left it was like the size of a fingernail it was that's they ate it the whole thing she said there was a a man who was there who left out some rubber boots outside and they ate a big piece out of those (laughs) and they ate the rubber handle off of her rake and just just, that just all that, and you can't what do you do, even. Burn them? You can I, no. They're working. The Department of Agriculture is working on a, something to do about them. Right. But it looked like they were they were trying to deal with them in the town. But we dropped over this ridge before we got to Silver City, and they they weren't nearly as thick. Like they were still, you still saw some, but they were not like mats of them. Oh, that's so gross. And, and I just thought to myself, you know, I get it that people want to eat organic. But sometimes you just want to eat. And imagine... Sometimes what you want is the bug-killing bomb. <laughs> <laughs> because those things... I mean, if they're going to no, eat... No, because... Some, eat the frisbees some, some out things, of your lawn. <laughs> some things are a pestilence. <laughs> it was so... What as we one, were driving... I thought this was so funny. Just as a side, I just find this entertaining. To be clear, I am in no way opposed to more organic pesticide... No. methodology. I don't no. care. But I did find it very funny that to keep apples organic, I think they're spraying the the spraying the trees with coyote urine. And I feel like there's a lot yeah. of questions that come to my mind about who is harvesting that. 
And where is this actually authentically created do coyote I, urine? But also, do I feel better about eating I that? don't know. I mean, I like there's questions. There's questions. But I just find it funny. That's all, is, guys. Is, we're not here to have a fight about no, pesticides. No, we're not. But I was just feeling like what you need in this moment is a pesticide because we you have mean, a pest You problem. need the raid people to be on this. <laughs> well, it was it was truly shocking. And the thing is, they all travel one direction. So they're all going across the road one way. They're all like heading north. Yeah. And if they run into a wall, they just spend their whole life bumping into it till they die. Like they will only go just that way. <laughs> and then if they hit water, they just drowned. Um, although apparently oh, wow. some of the other colored ones can swim. But anyway... They, we just drove over the top. Oh, and they're cannibals. So that's part of the problem is that you drive over them in the road. The other ones come to eat them, get driven over. It's it, it just real, real, real gross. And so as we're driving along, just crunching over these things, we, of course, busted out a little reading of the book of Exodus because we're like, let's let's reread that. Let's, because on our way to uh, the haunted Silver City, mm-hmm. let's have some time to, yeah, to, to celebrate the, the plagues, plagues of, of Egypt. <laughs> and, of course, it was so disgusting because all of us in the car are going like, ah, oh, gross. <laughs> and then because they're huge. And then and then you picture them all in in your house and every, oh, just everywhere. And then and eating. I mean, if they're eating the Frisbees and the rubber boots, you know they're leaving nothing behind. Yeah, no. Nothing behind them. They're killing you. They're eating the floors out of your house. (laughs) Anyway, but it did say in Exodus, I noticed that you couldn't see the ground between, which gives you that feeling that things were worse for them. And it said that there's never been a worse one. Like, it's just that that one never... Shall there be another plague like that? It was like as that? worse as it gets. So we knew that we'd not even begun to touch the level of trouble that was going on. You right. Know. That's really funny. I know. Um. So. I'm gonna roll. No. No, you're not gonna roll your window up. I am. I'm gonna roll them up for a minute. So anyhow, that's that's what we were that's doing. That's what Beck has been doing we for pleasure. We were encountering some plagues of locusts and some other exciting events. Yes. So, Becca, we meant to talk about something that was not haunted hotels and locusts. We did. We had something else. What we were going to talk about is sort of why we talk about what we talk about, what we what we mean by it. You know, like (laughs) what's the point? Well, we've been getting some questions lately. Um, Questions. Sometimes, sometimes we get comments or questions, and sometimes it seems to cluster on the theme yeah. where you think, okay, yeah, there's something here that we should right. talk about, we should right. touch on. Sometimes they're just random questions, and that's great too. But when there's a theme, so we're not answering a particular one, we're just talking about um, something that's come up a few times yeah. lately. Um, which, how would you summarize it? It's sort of like. I would say it is kind of like. How are you, like, how is you guys talking about Home domestic making. riffraffery <laughs> have anything to do with the gospel? Well, it's and kind of like, why don't you, you use if you, your platform for good? Right. And if you care about the gospel, why are you talking about weaving? Right. Um, or if you, uh, or I guess sort of like. Don't it's sort you of like, know, aren't there more important things? Don't you? Well, yeah, but not offensively. It's not no. like none of these have been snarky questions. It's just, and I, I think that this is such a big, big topic because I actually think it ties in with really big theological issues, and it that does. that's why it to people who share our theology it feels intuitive and obvious, and to people who have never been around. Um, I would say it's primarily post-millennialism, right? Um, that for people who have not been around post-millennial Christian living, uh, it feels bizarre. It feels sort of like, whoa, you know, you guys are like, why would you think that this is important or why? Um, and so fundamentally, I guess, like, how can you put this in that? This is, I just think that that's the overarching theological issue. So if you actually have questions, um, that is the theological issue to pursue understanding better. For us, it is the point, what we believe is that Jesus was victorious 
and that his victory on the cross is being worked out through the world now here, not just in a heavenly, um, yeah, so if you were going to do the kind of like uber simplistic Cliff Notes version. Which is what I'm trying to do and I'm finding it would hard. Be, yeah, it is. It's hard to just kind of like put it in a nutshell. But we don't think we're living in the end times. Yeah, like so, actually we would we would see where we are now is still kind of part of the early church. We're kind of the pioneers. You know, we have to conquer this world still. Like God... And clearly there's a lot left to do. Yeah, and God gave Adam you know, the creation mandate of, of like fill this earth and subdue it. And then man didn't do a good job with that. There was a lot of trouble, you know, as we know, took a wrong turn right at the beginning. Then you have the second Adam who comes and obeys where the first Adam sinned. And then so it's a turning before point in he all of leaves, history. He gives a command again to his disciples, which is go take the world like go the do great this commission. the great commission is go baptize the nations and so we take and that, that whole, as that a, every knee shall bow every tongue confess like the we, earth shall be as full of the knowledge of the lord as the waters cover the sea also jesus is at the right hand of his father until his enemies have been uh, put, have under, been his put feet. under his feet yeah. and so we Which believe is still that, not, that we haven't gotten there yet. We're still there is still much to do. Right. So we believe that the work of believers here is living faithfully as he has called us to live, seeking to fulfill the great commission and build Christian culture and yeah. Christian uh and honoring God and bringing the earth to know him. You know and like, the thing is is it, it's it's funny how this feels like totally not connected. But it so is because um, we think that Christians need to be building a culture that we hand to our children who hand to their children as we gradually are taking like over. Like leaven in the loaf yes. that it continues That's, to grow and multiply and right. spread. Like the mustard seed that is small but eventually yeah. grows or, to be big. Or the cloud the size of a man's fist. Yeah. Like, and so this is, I think, if you think we're living in the last days, then you have a, like, why would you bother building a civilization here? We're about to get raptured right, out, right. right? It actually does affect how you live. Actually, I remember grandpa and grandma um, saying they had missionary friends back oh, yeah. in the 50s, 50s or somewhere in there. You should and, mention grandpa and grandma who are not post mill, who were not post mill. No, they weren't. But but they had friends um, who thought that they were living in the last days. The tribulation was going to start any time now. So they, they wouldn't have any kids. Mm -hmm. It was like, of course we wouldn't do that. Why would we do that right. right now? So they never had children. The thing is, what you think about this really does affect some, How you some pretty mundane details right. about 100%. your life. And so if you feel like any minute now everything's going to be gone, then... Of course. Why would you? Why and would of, you spend time? Then of what value is is a yeah. beautiful table setting? Right. Because and that's a and so the the point or, that we're making is that not that we uh, think it's a beautiful table setting is the most important no, thing so. going, but we believe it's actually a tool for the gospel. So, but then so you've got the pre mill approach, which really believes we're kind of right on the brink. And then you have the awe mill approach, which is sort of like Christ's kingdom. Yes, it's there, but it's sort of in heaven. And it's what's a more happening? Spiritual thing what's happening, happening and not here connected on earth to earth is not connected. Like you've got something else going on, uh, which also means the stuff we do right here on, you know, in our lives on this earth, isn't connected to Christ's kingdom. Right? Like Christ's kingdom is in the Which, heavenly and it, places. And it creates sort of a other where kind of a feeling about yeah. your day to day life that it's not, it's not the gospel in your daily and life so, with like yeah. when you're doing the laundry. So it actually think, creates, well, this is just the baggage of our earthly existence. Yes. And then to care about the details feels like you, you're, you're being distracted away like from Christ's kingdom. Like you're being myopic in some way. You're like or, getting zoned in on something that doesn't matter. You're getting pulled off track. You know, yes. like you're, right, like focus on the more spiritual things and right. stop talking about yarn. But, well, 
But yeah, because it's sort of like that. Like, look, we have important yes, Christ's kingdom, but that's all spiritual. It's all right. It's all this. It's almost pla- platonic, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like mm-hmm. it's like it's everything. A, it's weightless. It actually only exists in your journal, where yeah. you're or wrestling, your where you're wrestling with yeah. your, and and it doesn't exist in how you open your home to company, how you make food, how you delight in the beauty of pie. You know, mm-hmm. it it's, doesn't, it, it doesn't, becomes more abstract. It becomes right. more like doctrinal stuff is where it's at. And this and, life, and like doctrinal, um, intellectual thoughts are where yeah. it is. Yeah. It's not. Um, and, but we do believe and and a lot of this, I have to be clear, a lot of this, there's overlaps everywhere yeah. with different theologies that the, and people who lean different directions. There's major. So we're not trying to say only our, um, that no ah mill person no, shares this no, approach. This we, is, it's this not is that. We're just trying simplistic. to, yeah, yeah. We're just trying to explain our own selves. But a little what bit to you, you believe about, well, as dad always said, your theology comes out your fingertips. Mm-hmm. It just does. And if we, this is not good of us to start chewing gum. No, we just both put a piece of gum in guys. Sorry. I'm going to take it out. Cause I feel like I'm going to start smacking and blobbing around. I just here. needed a minty flavor. I could go there. That's why I took it. But then I think this is getting yeah. bad. But anyway, I do think that... Um, At least it since, wasn't sunflower seeds or something. No, that would have been worse peanuts. <laughs> since theology comes out your fingertips, and what you believe in the abstract <laughs> actually really matters in the day-to-day. 100%. It does. You might not connect the dots yourself well, consciously, but it really does matter. So, Well, I would say, couldn't you say this is... Maybe I'm getting bad here with an analogy, but we believe your theology is a map. It's a beautiful map, but it is meant to get you somewhere. It is meant for the steps you're actually taking right here, right? right? So like the point of the map is not to hang it on the wall and admire the map. It's to go somewhere. It's to, sure. it's, and so when you say for us, we have this theology, but we actually believe it should be coming out in how we do our daily tasks. And we do think that scripture connects those things for us by calling women to love their homes and love their children and love their husbands. And to embrace that calling is not to sideline women. It is to give them a role in culture building, kingdom building, God honoring, gospel loving people. And of course, there's always multiple ways to do something wrong. Um, so yes, someone could get, um, distracted into, um, you know, only caring about a beautiful house for the sake of the beautiful house oh, itself. Oh, hundred percent. And people do. People do it all the time. I don't think they usually <clears> do <throat> it because of their post-millennial vision, but they do it because it is, it no, can be an is, idol. We think that this is a tool to build Christ's kingdom. And we think Christ's kingdom needs to be built here on this earth, not up somewhere in a different dimension. Yeah. We actually think Christ's kingdom is here and now, which I mean, means I think beauty, which is something that women are particularly good at beauty draws people and it mm-hmm. draws people to intellectual truths. I remember a teacher one time saying nobody was ever really convinced by an argument. Everyone's convinced by a person. And Mm -hmm. I know that that is, that's too, I'm sure people are convinced by arguments. But as a general rule, it really is the person making the argument that compels you to want to believe it. It's the thing that makes it attractive. And I think women are um, especially good at this and they can use that for the gospel. And it is, mm-hmm. it's not like it is a separate category. It really no, and, is. And we see things like, like, I know, I understand that if you've never been around this kind of Christianity, you've never seen any of this in action, you're imagining it being some kind of weird hobby central, uh, Pinterest living of like everything. Sure. All that matters is the photo shoot or something. And it, and it is not that way. But the thing that I think is so, um, important is that we are trying to reflect God as, and, and what he's done for us in our salvation. And so like when people say things like, isn't having a loom, a little superfluous, you know, why would you, why would you care about yarn when there are souls going to hell? 
And right. and the reality is, do I care about my yarn more than I care about souls going to hell? Absolutely not. I don't right. care more about my yarn. But but why does God make sunsets beautiful? Yeah. Why did he give us sheep with wool that uh, that takes dye so well and all mm-hmm. these radically colored things that grow out of the dirt that can make dye and that can do this and and how much it's us receiving the gift of a loving father and and God makes the world beautiful with his art and how much can we reflect that as we make our much smaller worlds beautiful but also in another sense um i think that enjoying a gift is how you show gratitude for that gift. Like Mm -hmm. if you gave your husband, like you gave him some, you know, I don't know, some great birthday gift, which he sort of said, Hmm, well, I think the, I, I think, think it's spiritual more important truths are that more are, important. I think it's more important and that, so our, I'll that just, our culture is in debt. So I'm going to put this in the closet and not look at it. It's sort of like sad. It, yeah. That's not how you show gratitude. And, and it's not how you love the giver. No. And it's not, how you thank the giver. It's like God has filled this world with so much potential and so much beauty and so much to discover and so much to do and And revel. And then I have to put right on top of that, the people who love it and who love it sometimes against their will. Yeah. That it doesn't matter if people don't want to believe in God, they love good food. Yeah. Like, and they, and if your home is a place of beauty and rest and joy and good food, how much more are you declaring a good relationship to the giver of those gifts? Like you are constantly declaring and to your own children, you're declaring how we feel about the giver of these gifts. But we also, and we've talked about this before, but gratitude is really the fuel that you should be running on. But I think there's a deeply ingrained sort of, it's like everyone that's Christianity has a big piece of glass in its foot sort of that's stuck way in there, which is we feel like we need to feel guilty. Right. And and guilt is the motivator. Guilt should be the thing that drives us. Guilt needs guilt, to be always guilt there. Guilt for the gifts. Yeah. Oh, oh, guilt. I see what you're, I know what you're going with. This. So, yeah. so basically like you should be motivated by guilt in some way. So, so you kind of have to feel bad about some everything. Well, I think that's what, what you're, drives I think you what to, you're trying to say is that a lot of Christians suffer from a guilt addiction Yeah, because what they're thinking is it's guilt that motivates me sharing the gospel with a neighbor. Yeah. But the reality is a far more long lasting motivator is gratitude. The gratitude for what God gave you is what gives you this urge to share it with your neighbor instead but, of. But gratitude is connected to actually being thankful for the stuff. Like, right. Actually, well, for instance, that husband who didn't care for the gift he got you, is he so excited about that? He's going to go tell a neighbor. Nope. <laughs> he's not going to go tell the neighbor because he's not enjoying the gift he was given. But that that joy is so contagious and it is a thing that people want to know. Why are you like this? How do you all like each other? Why are you, <laughs> why are you always having fun and leaving the lights on in your house? Because that's a, that's a thing we kind of laugh about is, um, rolling the windows. Again. What we would Sorry. call a lights out theology that is like, <laughs> Your house is just like a little bastion of silence with the light, <laughs> the lights out, the serious, the serious angst about your, about the sin in the world and all these problems in, inst- in, instead of being motivated by joy and gratitude and delight in the things that God has given us, it's trying to be motivated by kind of a hunker down, bunker yep. down and be thriftier. Is- you can't export what you don't manufacture, right? You can't right. actually tell people about the joy of faith and obedience if you don't know about that joy because you're always having a right. cranky face and, and so a guilt in a attack. lot of ways, we think that Christian homes ought to be sort of like a house on a hill with the lights on, with a roaring fire and the door open. Yeah, where and a good smell and, coming and out. And a good smell and people in there laughing 
and people delighting in things. And so we don't, and we think that that is showing gratitude to God. And of course we understand that there are pitfalls that could be had in such a pursuit, but there are always pitfalls in every pursuit. There's lots of pitfalls in not having that pursuit. Right. And And so many Christians think it is beneath them to spend time trying to figure out things like how to make a good pie or how to do, um, because they think, well, that would be wasteful of my, my, but, but this is the thing is, does God care about small little details? Well, I mean, what do you the think? The further we get down into studying creation, the more complicated, the more details we find. It's not like God cares about the macro, you know, like constellation levels. But once you get down into like microbiology, he's not right. interested. God cares Turns about out, the tiny details. He made and it, so we should be like him in that. Like we and should also, be. He gives the interested details, in small stuff. God he, is interested and in he small gives stuff. The details import he makes them matter so like the when you're talking about does god care about the little details well not only do the little details make a difference in the big picture like they actually i mean it's not just that they're interesting if you can get one off they actually contribute to the big picture yeah and i i do think that of course it is possible to do it wrong, get obsessed with the details, refuse to remember the big picture, all of that. Yes, of course you can do that. But we think that all these details about just mundane everyday life, we think they matter because we firmly believe in that big picture. Right. And so, yeah, okay, if you so if you got obsessed in it in some weird way no, and you like forgot the point of it. That's actually one of the sad things. Like Martha Stewart is a really talented homemaker with no home left to make, you know, (laughs) like I remember the time many years ago when it came out in the, one of her magazines, like the divorce album, how she kept her divorce memories in an album. (laughs) Like, let me show you how to organize this. Or when it was like, now that I finished remodeling this whole house and getting it all done. So everything's perfect. We're going to start over. And yeah. remodel the whole house and get it all done. And it, that is a that is what happens when you have people not not using their domestic life as a tool for the kingdom, but just having it be an end in itself. Like yeah. we just enjoy this, so we do it, and that's the end. And yeah, we believe that that can be done, but we don't think that that Must has to be, be done. done, and yeah. especially not done by Christian women who are actually doing what the Bible tells us to do, which is embracing our role at home and not doing it like it's a sad duty, but that it's an actual delight and that there's a huge role for women in this. And I think I'm reading that embarrassment of riches about the, um, reformation Reformation, and it's bizarre in a lot of ways. It's really weird. But some of the things that keep coming up is that how the women through seeing their role as important made like it built a culture that was so powerful through women I love having bizarre uh, standards. In of that things. book, it's very I, funny. I just I used that book back in college when I was writing my thesis, and it had a lot of great like leads to other sources about um, visitors coming to Holland, mm-hmm. which was really the most thoroughly reformed of. You know, like it was, England was always like slightly different and, you know, like it was, anyway, it was, it was kind of like a thorough, you know, thoroughly reformed. Anyway, I don't know if I should say most now, I probably overgeneralized. Anyway, it was a very uh, reformed place. Anyhow, visitors would come and these letters, they would write home about the women, the Dutch women. It was so funny. It was like, scared everyone. It was like, hey, they're very beautiful. They're more beautiful than any other women. They appear to like their husbands. They are allowed to talk they in were, group but settings. But they were also shockingly free in a lot of ways. Very like free. People were very yeah, upset they by were their allowed freedom. allowed to talk. They seemed to like their husbands. Their husbands trusted but they were them. Also, but they were also given a lot more legal rights. Like they ran yeah. more businesses. businesses and and they, had, uh, they had more 
inheritance. Yeah. Like, they played hardball financially, it seemed. Yeah. And they were also, like, their houses were beautiful and clean. But the cleanliness was, like, almost psychotic. It was oh. very funny. Yeah. Because well, it was I don't like, think Holland has changed in that no, department. No, <laughs> and they said that their, their front doorsteps had to be scrubbed every day. But you have to think, this was an era when, in Open most places, sewage. people were just yeah. throwing all of the sewer out into the street. Yeah. And in this world, the Dutch decided to scrub it, scrub and bubble the hole outside <laughs> all the time. It was like, yeah. we are handling it. But I think this is another thing where you realize your theology actually really matters. Right. And it comes out in details. Like, right. cr- clean streets and beautiful women and cheerful women who like their husbands and their, and husbands their children like them. and they like their children and they like their job and they enjoy their homes and, and they're so into it. That is like this impression. And I'm sure we've told the story before about, have we been on this subject before on the podcast? Probably, but I, I don't, don't know, know what story you're I building up to. I just remember like, um, an old, uh, lady that we took to church with us one time mm, who yeah. was an artist and she was very, she was not saved very bitter, wasn't speaking to her children. Like it was just, but she had an eye. She was an artist, you know, like she appreciated beauty and stuff. Anyway, she came to church with us once and her thing she said afterwards was, I've never seen so many beautiful people. And it's not because Christians have better cheekbones. No, it's like, it's because the prettiest thing that you can have is joy. Yeah. And freedom. And the I remember the atheist who came and debated dad? Yeah. And, oh, that's and right. he was in town and he, he was at our house for dinner, wasn't yeah, he, he afterwards? He came to Sabbath dinner afterwards. And so it was like he and dad had debated and then I can't remember who he was, but he was a he was a name. He was a decent name atheist atheist. And so he came and people were chatting with him at dinner about like, so you know, what do you think of Moscow or whatever? And he said, you know, he was like, I've never seen so many beautiful women. And he goes, and I live in Beverly Hills, which was. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you guys, that's not because we're running with the no, Beverly Hills beauties. No, it's not. And it is because we're a bunch of Idaho women who know Jesus. And, and that, and seriously, and that's it. Yeah. And that's it, was, it. We know Jesus and we like Jesus and what he's done for us and what he's called us to. But and that, that is something that I think God has built into the world that beauty is compelling. It's like, actually, I think that's why uh, when, when people go into like deep rebellion, well, Becca, they rebel we also, against we beauty. We also had that hilarious time where um, somebody who deeply despised dad, hated dad, super hardcore, and I believe was an author of lesbian romance novels. Oh, I forgot that detail. I think that's it. I think and that was true. I think that that's what she did. I think you're right. But she, you know, had a mullet. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that ironically. It was, it was literally a mullet and she hated us. Yeah. Like hated us. And I think she'd had too much to drink actually at this point, which is why such things came out. She became a bit freer with her. She just didn't care so much about keeping up appearances, (laughs) but she said, I mean, she essentially. We've been chatting with her for a while. We've been chatting with her and she said that if. What, how did she put it? She was kind of like, well... At the end of the evening, she was like, well, I guess if Doug Wilson raised you two, then, then he must have done he something He must right. be doing something right. And <laughs> the praise coming from such amazing places. But, but the point is, is that loving God and being at peace with your role in building his kingdom and what you're doing is a beautiful thing. Being at peace with it being grateful for being it and delighted being with it, being in it. busy with it and being like, and you know, recently, uh, recently I, I, when things are like tired, things are tired and stretched out and feeling run down. And yet we joyfully think God is giving us more and more capacity to do more, to lay our lives out, to spread ourselves out as thin as possible. And may he make it valuable. Like may yeah. he make this work matter. And not very long ago, I am in fact making a quilt right now. Oh, this yeah. is take your breath away with excitement that I am making a quilt. And it is for my daughter who 
out of everybody, I'm trying to help them have something for their new room mm-hmm. that they're excited about. And mm-hmm. I have one girl who has just consistently said, I really want a quilt. And it's like a thing she wants to mm-hmm. sew. There's a lot of reasons. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons that me loving her is right now means at a time where it does not make sense in my life, I am making a quilt. Yeah. And I was not feeling like it all the way making it right now because because things are chaos and it's just like a wild time to take on that right. job. And I know that it's not like life or death. Right. It's just a quilt. But I also know that God gave me all this fabric and he gave me a sewing machine and he gave me a little girl that this will matter to. Yeah. And what do I think God wants from me in that moment? And he wants me to get over myself and make the quilt. Like, and that's, and, and to delight in getting over myself and yeah. making the quilt. And also. And giving it freely to her as a, I hope that as you use this for however many years and run it down and mess it up. And that, that I hope that this always contributes to your knowledge of how God loves you and what the world is like yeah. and what it's for. And, it and how we delight in each other. To be a permanent, like. You're describing this like really beautiful thing, you know, making the quilt for your daughter and you're moving into the new house and everything. But we actually think it matters even if, I'm not trying to be depressing about your quilt, even if, you know, something goes terribly wrong in the wash or the dog ate it. Oh, 100%. No. Like, it's not not, like. You're not being depressing because the way I picked out the pattern for this quilt is I looked through the book to see what block could I sew the fastest. (laughs) This was how I picked it out. And I was like, listen, how about we just say we'll use the fabric that I have? Like, instead of picking. And so that's what we're doing. And we're randomly. But I just mean, like, we think it matters even if it's the sort of thing that the wind blows away. And if, the wind, and if the wind blows it away, the other thing that matters right after that is me laughing about it. Yep. Like the things that are eternal and valuable mm-hmm. is offering it freely to God. Because nothing is permanent. You make a beautiful flower arrangement for the table. It's going to be dead. It'll and die. horrid by Thursday. You're going to make a good meal. Everybody eats it. Yeah. And yeah, so they keep doing so that. So you do the thing even though it's transient because that's what life is, right? It's like, yes. it's just, it's love honestly yes love is what should be driving this and it should never be guilt of like oh no i haven't shared the gospel enough no because what gives you reasons to share the gospel is living a life full speed joy and gratitude and what you have in that instance is the gospel overflowing like in so many different places to talk to people about and i feel like if women all well Look, I wrote a book on the subject. Read Becca's book. (laughs) I think if women all decided to embrace their role in that way, I don't think our culture would have any idea. They're gonna have a book proposal to do with. Let's write a book together that can be like a sequel to both You Who and Even Exile, and we'll call it the Confluence. (laughs) (laughs) And the thing is, like, okay, the the confluence of domesticity. We also have to like finish this up but the thing is um some people have said like but we we need like tangible like ideas or you know like that kind of thing and I I get that like it's sometimes it's all great to talk theory but you kind of need a picture of something you know to like send you somewhere but this project is far bigger than any one woman could ever give you a checklist for because guys I haven't ever gotten to I've never gardened well that, and so the some of you have to handle that. You got to be but out also, there. Also, it's like this requires women of all walks of life in all parts of the globe. But also, and all of them using their imagination. I want to say I want to say something important here. Not competing with each other, but Gosh, shoulder, no. but shoulder to shoulder, encouraging one another, inspiring one another, being like, well, if she can make bread like that, by golly, I think I can make bread yeah. like that. And let me like, let's just work together because we're not all supposed to be doing the same thing. We're no. all supposed to be doing it for the same king. Well, just think about but it. But not like, exactly the same Imagine things. if you had a community of faithful Bible believing women in Morocco, like 
It what would cool look, things would it happen would there? Be so different, and I can't I like. We couldn't be like, here, ladies, this is oh. what you need to be doing. No, because you know what they don't need to do? They don't need to make <laughs> quilts like me. They no. don't need to do that. They're probably got to do something cool with tile. I yeah. don't know what they're up to, but it's good. And the thing is, is like, we need all the women using their own individual gifts and their own imaginations and their own obedience and, and raising yes, their own children in the love of the father. But like, like cross pollinate by all yes! means. But. <laughs> Just, we need... Too bad we aren't excited about this topic, Beck. <laughs> Too we bad need, we can't gin we up any lots, enthusiasm. Lots more women, guys. Lots yes. of them doing and, this. And so that to bring this full circle, that's why we talk about it. Yeah. That's why we talk about the things that we're doing. It's not because... And I loved, like almost loved with the point, the comments that I get from various things that choke me up which is funny to say it, but they do every time, yeah. was one message I got a while ago from someone who was thanking me for something. I can't remember. It was probably was the podcast. It was something in whatever. But she said, so here I am up in the, I feel she was out in the outer fringes of Canada somewhere. You know who you are when you, if you listen <laughs> to the podcast, saying that she made her first pie. because, yeah. And she said she made her first pie and messed it up. And because she was listening to us, she laughed about it, threw it away, and started over. That's great. And you know what? Choked me right on up. You know why? <laughs> because I'm like, because there's people in Canada that are going to have a better life with pie. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna be up there making pie, and it's going to be so much better. <laughs> and then the other thing is, on our last episode, whatever quote that was that Jake put up of me saying, how many things could I be bad at for a long time? Yeah. And somebody commenting that, I think this is why my wife is learning French oh, now. Like it's the um, best learning French, and somebody else said it. They started a quilt because so of it, great. and I can't tell you how much that delights me because I think that is the goal. Or when I was at somewhere signing books, and people are actually in line and ask me a sourdough question, like where they're lovely. like, "So I'm it. trying sourdough because of you." And someone else, you know who you are. Team Sherwood out there who brought their knitting for help in line, and I, I love it. and to me that is so delightful because it thing it's like women wherever you are. I said that about I have a daughter who wants a quilt, I have fabric, I have a sewing machine, but wherever you are, you have things at the ready that you could use that you could. Yeah. And it turn might be to. a quilt, it might be sourdough, no, it I'm might saying, be. It might be. Look, here it might I be am a different with, language. It's, yes, that's awesome. We don't know. But, that's awesome. but the point is, there are ingredients and components at your hands, at your fingertips that have been given to you that you could glorify God by enjoying, by by diligently working to learn something, by thinking, like Chesterton said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Yep. It's worth learning. It's worth the struggle of learning. And so it's worth trying to make pies and trying so, to make things. I hate to bring it to the Iliad, but I'm going to... Um, Why not, though? I mean, <laughs> I like to touch base on the we classics. We uh, reading the Iliad in the car. Uh, on our way back, which was hilarious. We were alternating between that hideous strength and the Iliad. Um, and we're, you know, right before this Let's big battle. Let's not let it be said that the Merkels aren't interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Becca likes to establish her street cred as, as the odd one. So we're reading the Iliad and you've got before the battle, like, right, it's this big battle is coming and Agamemnon is moving through the ranks and he is getting everybody ready to get yeah. out there and, and yeah. do it and win glory and do all, you know, like, yeah. and he's just working his way through the ranks and he's, some people he's sort of trash talking and other people he's encouraging and right. it's this whole thing. I kind of feel like that's what we're wishing we could do. Yeah, that's what we're trying to like, do. And ladies, that's why, and that's why we There's a actually, battle here. And it's <laughs> why we think that the podcast is a tool that might be for the used gospel. for the gospel if we get women to learn French and try <laughs> quotes and learn to bake bread and like, and how much more could we in, should we share the gospel because, through equipping and encouraging women to yeah. use everything at their fingertips to delight we have in the gospel? A world to take. Yeah, I mean, this there is, is important stuff. There is work 
to do. And we yeah. need, and there's enough work for every last one of us to throw our whole lives into this and still just be the early church. Exactly. Now, we need to have a tip. Wow! We got <laughs> We got to go. We, we got to get this done. We have soared to enthusiastic heights we today. Have, we have indeed. Okay, I so. I want to say something real fast. True for single women also. Oh, gosh. That the should be a separate podcast. The fact that we have podcast. children, we need to do another one. But I just want to say right now that it is not. Building culture is not only the role of married no. women with children. Also, it's every woman. being domestic should not be only if yes. you're married so with children. So we're getting that out of the way real quick. Maybe yeah. we'll do a different we, podcast We should that. do that. Um, okay, tip. Do you have a tip? I have a tip. Um, I probably have a tip. You do yours first. Okay, guys. The 4th of July is tomorrow. And we all know what that means. Corn on the cob. Corn on the cob. I am, well, and pie. And pie. And homemade ice cream. <sighs> True. I'm bringing some a lot some of pie, meanings. And I'm bringing the corn on the cob to the thing tomorrow. Now, I don't know if we're going to get this posted before tomorrow, but either way, it's good for the summer. That And I've said this before, but I'm reminding you because you probably forgot. Cooler corn is amazing because you can do corn on the cob for all the masses that you need. So Mm -hmm. you get as many shucked ears of corn as you need. So do all the shucking. No, make your children do all the shucking. It's anyway, put them all in the cooler, boil a big pot of water, like a stock pot of water, and then pour it over the corn and shut the lid and then take it to wherever you're going. It, it'll be perfect by the time you get there. It's like 30 minutes, maybe that Mm -hmm. it. And it stays another, hot another the technique. rest of the night. It uh, stays hot. You can just keep going and getting another hot ear of corn out of the cooler. It's real good. Yeah. Another component that we can to say for the 4th of July is to cut your watermelon into sticks of watermelon that are much easier to eat when you cut than it. Than a triangle. Yeah. Like when you cut it into like, you cut it, you slice it, and then you cut it into like where it has a square of rind at the bottom mm. and then a pillar of watermelon. Yeah, that is a good tip. Then you, it's easier to fit on your plate mm-hmm. in an orderly fashion. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, I yeah. just. And the other tip is make a pie. Even if you've never made one if in your you life. you've never made, made a pie. One. Actually, uh, uh, we got to think, let's think right now. We just got to tell everyone to share, a, share it, share it. Tag us in your pie pictures. Oh, that'd be fun. Tag us in your pictures of your 4th of July pie time. And I guess if they tag us, then we'll see it, right? We don't awesome. need a hashtag. No. Just hashtag tag us. spread the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Thank all right. you all for coming and Have listening to week. our impassioned time. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.